Hi, I'm Sarita Chowdhury, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Hello, Damien and our friends. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. I realized that I wasn't just speaking to you on Zoom the way that I am like every other day that there are hopefully, presumably other people listening to this. So hi, everyone. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of You Might Know Her From. With Damien and Anne. I am Damien here at my mother's house in the back room where there are dogs just a barking outside. I'm here in my bedroom in New York, and I am in a full sweatsuit. I have not brushed my hair, and I'm wearing a Mighty Ducks hat. So it is like, I feel like we're having a real morning session, which is rare for us to record in the morning, but here we are. Here we are. Something I wanted to talk to you about the other day was, you know, there's a real (laughs) good lineup of people on Dancing with the Stars that seems really yes. in alignment with our interests. And that would include our favorite Backstreet Boy, AJ McLean, mm-hmm. and Nelly, who I am quite charmed by. Same, uh, and Nelly's from St. Louis, which I love. And then there's a couple other people, but the most important person being Anne H. Anne Hayes. So she is very eccentric <laughs> on the show. And so what I've been thinking about and what I've wanted to talk to you about is, so I went on her Wikipedia page and it says, you know, it does acknowledge our relationship with Anne Heche, which actually was a sh- surprise to me. But then it says, it does Heche not. Said, it does. It does. It does. Okay. It does. But it says like, Heche has said, this is her only relationship with a woman has been this her only relationship with a woman. And I was like, that seems like oversharing. Like it seems like doth protest too much or whatever that stupid yes. expression is. And yes. so then I was like, if we ever land an interview with Anne Heche, which seems bound to happen while she's doing the press tour for Dancing with the Stars. We're fighting for it, folks. We are really angling hard. But like, uh, obviously, as two queer people, one self-identified lesbian who both of us love lesbian culture, lesbian pop culture, that yeah. we would want to talk to her about like being part of an it couple with one of the most famous lesbians in America. And, and by that, you mean Corey Lafoon. <laughs> From men was that and his trees. name? I made, I literally made that name up. I'm not sure that's. I it. have no idea. I do think it was like a Corey or a Cody. Yeah, but like then I was like imagining that her being like, I'm not fucking doing this interview. <laughs> I we we have yet to have a Zoom walkout. We almost had a walkout, you know, in person. It never happened. But we haven't had anybody like throw down their headphones and like or like shut their laptop. So I feel like it's coming at a certain point. I feel like it's bound to happen during this iteration of it because I feel like we're fe- we can feel emboldened <laughs> to ask like <laughs> Anne so when you and Ellen when she was in these walls could talk too were you jealous or actually was she in these walls she was di- she directed <gasps> the scene she directed the vignette with Sharon Stone and Ellen DeGeneres she directed their love scene and I believe that Dido's <laughs> song is playing in the background during that sex scene I think you see Ellen's breast and then it ends they're having a baby, of course, and it ends with like maybe Sharon Stone bouncing on a an exercise ball, or I think it's Ellen bouncing in on an exercise ball in Joy While Natalie Cole's Everlasting Love <laughs> plays over the credit roll. Honestly, I watched it opening night. I remember getting off the phone to be like, if these walls could talk too is premiering, I've got to go. <laughs> Who were you on the phone with? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think it came out in 2001. I literally could make it up, but I literally was like, I got to get out of here. This is about to start. I have to set my VCR to EP record. Cooler that I was in college renting these movies from um, Hollywood <laughs> Video, being like, I've never seen these. The, I've never seen these iconic two films. I need to watch them. I really felt like the first one was good. The second the, one, obviously. The first I, one was dark. The first one was very dark. Yeah, Cher gets, spoiler shot. alert. Cher gets shot. She gets shot. Demi Moore has like a oh. an abortion on on the table. I think about it constantly. Whenever we used to go to Ninth Avenue Saloon and we would get that hanger (laughs) for the bathroom. RIP Ninth Avenue Saloon, one of the best bars in Mm. New York City, but I find it frustrating that they did have the women's bathroom key on a hanger. I thought it was pointed. Yeah, and I always thought of Demi Demi Moore, Demi, getting an illegal (laughs) abortion in If These Walls Could Talk, one. So the second one is, why are we talking about this? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> lesbian culture and Hayes and Hayes directed the third vignette this the second if these walls could talk was much lighter in tone generally speaking yeah 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 but anyway re- highly recommend <laughs> 
if you have an in with Anne Heche or Corey LaFoon, are they divorced? I yes. don't care. Or they're separated, okay. I think. I looked they're it up the other together, day while but... watching her on Dancing with the Stars. She's very eccentric. I love it. She hasn't changed. She just has only ever had sex with one woman. So... <laughs> I don't like that people say that. It just is like, okay, I had this one moment. I slept with a girl in college. Right. It's, it's, it's like, like it's, it's, it seems, again, it's like an overshare. Like, if that's true, yeah. then cool. Yeah. But if also, like, it's okay if it's not true. She it's put it on her own Wikipedia it. page. She put it on in there. I know she did. I know she did. <laughs> anything you want to tell me? <laughs> no, no. I literally, I, I don't, I don't have anything to tell you. I feel like. <laughs> talking about Anne Hage is the best way to start my day but I want to welcome everybody back to the show thanks for sticking with us we're so glad to be back for season three also I don't know if you heard from last episode but we are doing a book promotion show promotion I have an essay featured in the book she founded at the movies women writers on sex desire and cinema and I write about the sound of music and my sexual desire for Julie Andrews and Charmian Carr anyway if you would like a free copy of this book sent to your homestead or wherever you're parking yourself during quarantine, all you have to do is what, Damien? You need to be following us on social media and be able to prove that. So you can already be following us or you can be a new follow. And then you also need to give us a five-star review with some written words. And if you've already done that, then you need to prove to us that you made somebody else do it for <laughs> us. Bless you. Thank you so much. And Anne is also <laughs> going to sign it. That's exactly right. So DM us with those details. We're really excited. The book is wonderful. And we are just excited to be more in touch with you this season. So welcome back. We were thrilled to have the interview that we have this week. Our guest was, I'm just going to say A+. Plus. I feel like we really vibed with this person, which, you know, sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't. But she was totally down for us. We are talking <laughs> about the great Sarita Chowdhury, who put up with our bullshit and was super fun along the way. I just want to say that we had sort of been pursuing Sarita for a minute, and she was like down to do it, but was working. And her people were like, yeah, 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 follow up, follow up. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And then we did get her. And then it was like, we were having tech issues and we were like, oh my gosh, Sarita, so sorry. And she was like, no problem. Let's do it in a couple of days. We also, upon, you know, upon rescheduling, we still had technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, not everything always goes to plan, but because we had Sarita in our grasp, we just decided to say yes. That being said, the audio quality is going to be different from what you're used to hearing from us. So just bear with us. The content is great. The interview is great the quality is going to sound a little bit different because we didn't have everything at our fingertips. You might know her from Homeland, Mississippi Masala, Jessica Jones, She Hate Me, Kama Sutra, Learning to Drive, A Hologram for the King, and The Hunger Games Mockingjay. It has been a true joy, a true journey to get here. We are thrilled beyond belief to be here with actress Sarita Chowdhury. Sarita, thank you so much for being on You Might Know Her From. Thank you so much. Sakina Jaffe told me that if I didn't do this, I'd be missing out. We Me love her. She was lover. like one of our favorites and we were so glad. And we were like, can you put in a good word with us, with Sarita? That would be great. She loves you. Yeah, she's very funny. We're very excited to talk to you today because at the time of this recording, we are like a week or two out from the release of your new horror film, Evil Eye. Wait, you said that like I do many horror films. <laughs> <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. We're going to get to it. <laughs> the trailer recently went viral. I'm not sure if you know this. The trailer went viral with people praising both like the scary horror element, but also like Indian representation in horror films. So we haven't seen the film yet, but we're very into the trailer. We also love Sunita Mani. What can you tease us about Evil Eye to our listeners? Oh my God. So Evil Eye... First of all, I've never done a horror movie and I've always been scared too because I always think, oh my God, how are you going to do that like face <laughs> or just, I feel like there'd be a lot of double chins. I don't know. I'm just scared. So when they asked me, I was like, oh, and then I saw it. It's like, oddly enough, if you take a story from a country you don't know, like in this case, India, it's so strange what's normal in another country that you could do a normal story and it could seem like horror. So for me, this, this is not a horror movie. But then when I saw the trailer, I was like, oh, like I just did it like a domestic movie. You know, <laughs> housewife, 
believes and is superstitious and believes something that her daughter is like, oh, come on, mom. And it turns out to be true. But that's a normal Indian situation. Did you know that people were really like buzzing about it on social media? Like, did you know that was a thing that was happening like a week ago? No. Yeah, people are here for it. They're very excited. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, wow. Yeah, good. And so Sunita is so cool. Love her. We are a huge fan of hers. You haven't done a horror film, but I feel like you're no stranger to genre because you've done like Jessica Jones and The Hunger Games. So can you talk a little bit, I guess, if you didn't know that Evil Eye was genre, can you talk a little bit about doing genre in some of those other series and like what the difference is between doing genre and doing like a straight domestic drama? Yeah, so there shouldn't be a difference, but you can't help but know that you're in Jessica Jones. Like you go <laughs> on the set and you're like, oh my God. And you're just so happy you have the role. So you have to get rid of all that to do the acting. That took me a while. Basically, there shouldn't be a difference, but the difference is it constantly feels iconic as you're just literally trying to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm just going to get my violin. But you, it, it's very hard to do. So the work is to make it normal because it's in your head, iconic. Like being on Jessica Jones set, like I literally just spend a lot of time staring at all of the women are so cool on that set. Yeah, I was a bit overexcited. So I, I spent a lot of my time just trying to pretend to be relaxed. <laughs> do, you, do you watch genre at all or no? no. Like you're n nothing like superhero, sci-fi, or none of that? No, like I'll go to the list of the Venice Film Festival winners in the last 20 years and watch every Korean film. That's what I do. So no, but when I'm there, I, I then kind of, it's like you're a kid and then I go back and watch everything. And yeah, I love it. So Serena, you've made your career in art house hits, indie films, prestige cable drama and the theater. As we're talking about genre, can you talk about what it was like to come in and film the final two Hunger Games films and like what it was like to walk onto like this huge, big budget, like blockbuster type film? First of all, when I got the call for that, I always thought of it as Hunger Games, but it was called Mockingjay. And so when my agent said, Sweeta, they're interested in you from Mockingjay, I said, what's Mockingjay? And my <laughs> daughter, who was at the other end of the room went, what? And she just started jumping like, yes, yes. And I just went, yes, because I, I didn't know what it was, but I could see her excitement. So I shot it in Atlanta in France. And when we got to France, first of all, the sets are so ridiculous. And the catering, like just the food to eat offset. No, it's just in another proportion. Like I loved it. Like I would sell out in a second. <laughs> we're, really invested in, we're really invested in craft service conversation here. So I, that's a, like, it was literally in my notes was to say, was craft services significantly better? It was. The yeah. answer is it was. It was, was it like lobster tail or like what sort of, what was the elegance of craft Sashimi. services? We're talking wine. Because also in Europe, when you film on break, you have to provide beer and wine for the crew. Yeah. What? Yeah. Every, every European set I've been on, I've had a glass of wine at lunch. And then you have a little siesta. But it's not like people are lazing around. You're in a great mood and you're back to work. It's great. No, so wine. And it was just the fact that there were 12 different cheeses and they were good quality and grapes beside them. I mean, it's like, it's ridiculous. And yet you see French movies, they're good. It's not like they're bad. I would, like in the 80s, I wonder what it's like on sets in European cinema if everybody was just like offered cocaine at craft services. Oh my God, but when you said 80s, yeah, in those big coats and just ravaged front areas. Yeah. Oh my God. Okay, Sarita, one of your most recognizable roles was in Homeland, where you played Mandy Patinkin's on again, off again wife, Mira. This was obviously a huge hit. The spy thriller premiered 10 years after 9-11 and was acclaimed for its exploration, not only of terrorism and national security, but also really covered a lot of issues about mental health and even the ideas of like good versus evil. Can you talk about how that job came your way? And like Mockingjay, if it was an immediate yes. You know what's so weird about talking to both of you? I feel like I'm just telling you the truth. I don't know why I'm not. 
That's what we want. Don't filter through your people. No, I, I, won't, I won't start now. But literally, because I'm smiling and I'm talking to you. So Homeland. So first of all, it was an audition. Second of all, Homeland wasn't Homeland when I auditioned. Like, so I didn't know. I just had a, a script. And it's not like you can tell it's going to be the brilliance it became. So I just went into the audition. And I remember oddly that day looking at the role and thinking, Mandy, I knew Mandy was in it. I was like, he's such a, I don't know, he's so bigger than what I, than an adjective I could find that I thought, okay, I'm going to go in there. I'm just going to do this character breathing normally. That was in my head. And I was sitting there and I remember the casting director would say something. It was Judy Henderson. And I would just kind of take her in. I've never been that relaxed, but I knew I had to do something to match Mandy Patinkin. And then I got the role and I was just so happy. And then when I went to set, a little terrified because Mandy, I mean, now we're, we're friends and we're so close, but I was scared of Mandy. His reputation precedes him. His reputation. And when you're on set with him, he seems like he's concentrating on something that you're not privy to. <laughs> Later, I found out he, you know, like for example, he's very into knowing what props are on set, which is so smart and getting used to them so that they're not a surprise and all. But you don't know what he's really doing. And also when he says his lines, I swear to God, you look at the script because you're like, I don't recognize those. And they're exactly the same. That I haven't figured out yet. But then well, we actually had to go to Morocco to shoot a scene and we, they put us in side by side in the airplane, which I was just like terrified because I thought, oh my God, he's going to know me really for who I am when you're on a plane and you fall asleep and you're drooling like it's embarrassing and um I remember (laughs) I was watching movies and he was reading sheets of music and I was like no this is too much like this guy cannot maintain this level of excellence like we're on a plane and for something on that plane something happened where we started laughing and on that plane ride we talked we talked about everything. And now I find him such a sweet, easygoing guy. Like, it's interesting when you have an idea of someone and then you get to know them. You can't go back to ever seeing them as someone you were nervous around. You know what yeah, I mean? Totally. I have to say that I had an impression of him being as serious Mandy Patinkin as he was. But then his son has maybe been running his Instagram recently. And it's like him and his wife. It's so charming. Like their whole quarantine life together has given me a different vibe of Mandy Patinkin. So I'm glad to see that, but also hear it from you that like he was probably studying some unpublished Sondheim musical that's like set to be produced in five years. But he's also like a good guy and easygoing. Once you get to know him. very funny and wants to joke around and he's so easygoing. I think he's just so bright that most people I think in life want, we all want people to look at us to make us feel better and then we can relax. And he, he just doesn't feel that need. So it does take that long to be able to, you know, that's cool. Can you look back at your career now and sort of mark it by like pre-Homeland and post-Homeland? Like was Homeland a shift for you? Like my mom, I was telling her we were interviewing you and she was like, oh, Homeland. Like my mom, you know, my 74 year old mom was like, yes. So I feel like it was a shift, yes? Yes. I mean, it's weird. It took me a while to realize that or admit that because post-Homeland, I started getting request to come in for things that I never did before. I did this film with a German director called Hologram for a King and Tom Tickfer, who, did you guys see a film called Run Lola Run? Yes, of course. It was formative for me. Formative. So he did this film called Hologram for a King and he came to New York to look for, you know, the actress to be the love interest for Tom Hanks. And she had to be Arab, uh, mixed, when I met with him, the first thing he talked about was Homeland. And I remember just thinking, oh, that's what's changed is in Germany, they watch Homeland. And now I get to meet him. Do you know, I'd never had that level before that was, you know, that it branched out so much. And I was so grateful because Run Lola Run at Angelica Cinema was my life. And here I was having a coffee with him at Raoul's, not far from Angelica, like 20 years later. So that's how it changed my life. He wouldn't have known about me. 
Okay, Sarita, you leapt off the screen in your film debut, Mira Nyer's Mississippi Masala. The 1991 romantic drama about interracial love between a black man and a Ugandan Indian woman living in small town Mississippi cast you opposite the already super famous Denzel Washington. So you weren't a working actress at the time that you landed the role. Can you talk a little bit about what that process was like of landing the role and then how you walked onto that set first day? It was all shenanigans. I don't know how I got that role. That was ridiculous. I was in London. She was casting in America. Then she went to London and then she was going to end up in India. And I was in London and someone told me that, oh, this woman, Mira Nair, is looking for this woman to play this character. And I was kind of obsessed with her because I'd seen her documentaries and Salon Bombay. And so I found a way to get an audition. I had to get a pre-approval from the casting director. And when I walked in, it, all that went fine. And then when I came back, I came back with oily hair that I'd oiled. And the casting director was like, why did you do that? And I was like, sorry? She was like, go out, get it washed at a barbershop and come back and explain why you were, or make up a reason why, why you were late. And I was like, oh, so I did. And like an, and I was like nervous. And then I come back and I walk in and I, she had me come in three times. And back then I had no money. So if I went in, I was living outside of London. If I went into London, I had to stay there. If there was a call back, I couldn't like go home and come back. And the third day she said to me, that was really great, Suda. Um, do you want to meet later for a drink? And I was like, I have to stay. So I'd stay four hours and then meet her. And over that drink, we're just chatting. And then suddenly she went, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Would you do the honor of playing Nina? And I ran to a pay phone and called my parents in Bangladesh, crying. And they didn't even know I was auditioning. And so they couldn't understand. And then six months later, we were in uh, New York rehearsing, because well, Denzel was doing Shakespeare in the Park. So we were rehearsing in New York and then we went to Mississippi. You're both so hot in the movie. You have great chemistry. Like when you look back at it now, I mean, it's, you've been working for 30 plus years since it, and you've talked about the movie so much in the press, but like what stories do you sort of tell your daughter about that first, your film debut opposite like an A-list movie star? You try not to talk about it because it, like, first of all, when you meet Denzel, he's so charismatic that there was a point where he said to Mira, do you think Sarita will ever look at me in the eye? Because I was like 21 and I was like, he said, what? Like, I was like, I'm going to look, I'm going to choose the time when I'm going to look at him. I, I was like, I got really, and so at one point I did. And I feel like that helped the movie because I think he was like, oh. And then I started laughing and I remember that scene. It just kind of went whoosh. But I remember thinking, I can't believe he thinks I'm shy. But what it was, was he was so charismatic and I was literally learning how to act. And I didn't want to like, let him down. But it's that age where you're so shy, but you're so ballsy. It's a great mix, you know? So I look back and I think, damn, I wish I was more of that now. Because there was part of me that I was like, really, Denzel? I'm going to look at you in the eye and you're going to fall. Like, <laughs> and he, you know, to his credit, like, I don't know. It, it's something about it worked. It, I see that film and I'm like, it was good at the imbalance that we had, you know, in terms of work and fame. And, and in the end, he was such a sport because it must have been so wild being with all Indian women, all of us in bright colors, laughing and drinking tea. And there was Denzel who had just won an Oscar for glory. Did, you, did that sort of imbalance transfer offset? So when you guys were all hanging out, like, did you run lines with him on set? Was he sort of like movie star no, in his he, trailer? No, or? He, he would have run lines with me. It's when you're shy, you assume someone doesn't want to run lines with you. So you run off. So I think his point to Mira was, hey, I'm around. She can hang out. But it was me protecting my shyness that I would leave before he would, in my head, reject me. It was that thing. And again, I got to know him later and I was like, oh my God, he's such a nice guy and he's so normal. Like, what's up with me? So Sarita, your partnership with the director Amira Nair continued with roles in Kama Sutra, A Tale of Love in 96, and then later The Perez Family in 2005. 
What kind of shorthand have you established with her over the years, if any? It's crazy with Mira. Like she, again, is someone, if other people meet her, she's got these wild eyes. And when you talk, she just stares at you. And, and she, she's very charismatic and a little intimidating sometimes. But she, we became so close, obviously, on the Sipi Masala that, yeah, it's almost like she doesn't have to direct me. Like, I need hugs from her, and I need her to laugh with me. It's like I need to feel comfortable and to know she's happy. But she's very opinionated. So, yeah, she, it's like having a family member direct you. It's the best thing in the world, but it can be tricky. Did working with her on her set for your first movie spoil you for any future sets? Like, did she do something that is very different than other directors you've worked with? Yeah. I mean, first of all, and it, not to generalize, but when, you, when you're a female actress working with a female director, the question you asked before, the, the shortcut, the, it's there, first of all. And also... Mira, like, first, there's the blessing on the set. There's the whole ritual. We used to have to do, like, for Kama Sutra, we have to wake up every morning and do yoga all together. We had to go to a dancing ashram for a month, me and Indira, and farm with them and learn. They wouldn't teach us how to dance because they said it was blasphemous that we were learning. And so when we came back from a month of camp, all we knew how to do was sit straight. And Mira was like, Sorry? She's like, we need you to dance in like two days. And I, we were like, I know, it's blasphemous though. So but it's those worlds that Mira enters huge mythical kind of worlds with elephants. And so when you get used to that, it's different, you know, going to Atlanta to shoot or Charlotte to shoot Homeland. In Kama Sutra, you and Indira Varma, who you mentioned, play 16th century frenemies, for lack of a better word, maybe. That is so funny. (laughs) In India, and she is your servant, and you marry a prince, but not before he sleeps with her first. The movie was shot on location, has beautiful cinematography and costumes, and enough sex in it that it was banned in India when it was first released. Were you and the cast and crew at the time surprised by that response? No, I knew it would be, I was surprised we even got through filming. How did you guys learn the dances if you weren't taught because it was blasphemous? Was it sort of improvised or did you? (laughs) Mira hired also another teacher to come quickly and we learned. Okay. You know, but yeah, the government was, even when we were filming, you know, they would come to set and be around and I don't know how she pulled that off. That was tricky. I feel like nowadays there would have been maybe like an intimacy coordinator since there were so many like sex scenes. But can you talk about how Mira like handled those scenes on set? I mean, you have sort of like a, you have a rape scene in the film and there's a lot of, it's not explicit, I would say. It's just like, there's a lot of sex. There's a lot of sex in the movie, but it's not explicit or pornographic or whatever. No, true. God, when you just said that about intimacy directors, I, wow. That's the weird thing is we almost need to, intimacy directors for back then now everyone anyway there's certain political correctness that you don't need it as much but then oh my god again no mira is great if she doesn't see something she wants to happen or like a shot she imagines she'll literally get into the bed and start telling you stories like mira she's 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 funny and wild and yeah, there is, it's like she's always constantly throwing a dinner party wherever she is. And so you don't really see it as, because of the ritual she needs. And I think Kama Sutra was so coded in ritual that the actors felt safe because you had to move your hand this way to touch the person. So everything had a math to it. So I felt very safe on that set. But intimacy directors, that would have been nice. After your debut in Mississippi Masala, you've said that Hollywood didn't really know what to do with you or what race to cast you as. So you took offers in New York and London to do theater. It's been almost 30 years since Mississippi Masala and you're still, God love you, you're still a New York based actor. What is it about New York that has kept you here? Or have you ever felt tempted in this, you know, in your vast career to relocate to LA like for the work? Do you know, initially when I when people would say, well, why won't you come to LA for a bit? I mean, it was, it was true. I'd go to LA and I felt lost. I don't drive. 
I didn't know how to handle it. I always get a, I, I always got a little melancholic there. I didn't know why. So I just wrote on that answer for a few years. And then I realized <laughs> New York, everywhere else you have to make a choice if you want to be there. And that place takes over a certain feeling in you, but New York doesn't. And I'd never found a place that kind of matched just whatever mood I was in. There's nothing oppressive about New York. It always makes you feel like, oh, that dream you forgot, you can do it tomorrow. You always have this chance to be who you thought you might be. And I love that. Like, I feel very free there. Also, no one really, there's a lot of New Yorkers who don't have their family in New York. So you don't feel that alone because a lot of people move to New York for their dreams. So it's comforting to know that, oh, on Thanksgiving, other people can't go home to their parents necessarily. So I'm not the only one. I, I don't know. That it, I like it. I love that answer. Thank you. Okay, so Rita, in House of Spirits, you played a Chilean woman. In A Hologram for the King, you play a Saudi Arabian woman. And in A Perfect Murder with Michael Douglas, he refers to you as a Castilian femme fatale. How have the ways in which you're cast changed since you've become more established in your career? I would say now in my career, it's, it's it, before it was like anything that wasn't straight up white girl. I had a chance at. Now it's just, and like the other day, there was a character written for a 63 year old man and they were like, are you interested in this? And I read it and I was like, I am. So now it's just the character. It doesn't matter. I mean, it still matters. It's not, it's not like I'm in this utopian world, but it's, I definitely can be considered for things that go beyond the color and the ethnicity. Yeah. How often are you tasked with like doing an accent? Like where they're like, you need to do like an Indian accent for this. And you're like, cool. So it's interesting at the beginning, I'd be like, I don't want to just do that. Now, I don't know what happened to me. Like anytime I'm offered an Indian role, I, I really want to. I think it's also because I want to represent as much as I can. And sometimes I don't even do it that well, but I'm just like, I want to put these women out there you know, my auntie, my grandmother, like elements of them. And so now it's a thing I'm proud of, even though I'm sure like, you know, my auntie in Calcutta, when she sees evil eye is going to be like, <laughs> Rita doesn't even know how to cook. Like, <laughs> it's acting auntie. <laughs> it's acting auntie. <laughs> um, do you have a rubric for yourself in terms of like sort of what roles you will accept and like what, your reasoning or what your process is for choosing a role? Mm, no, no rubric. I guess the good thing is the more work you do, the more hopefully your agent or manager kind of senses where you're heading. So like you hope what's being sent for you to read is at least vetted on a certain level, which is also dangerous because sometimes, you know, a newcomer could write the most brilliant script and can't get, it can't get to you. So you also probably, you know, are too, too protected sometimes, but it's pretty much based on if I like reading it. And because I feel like I'm catching up and getting to do things I never got to do, I often surprise my manager and agent as to what I like. Can you explain that? Meaning like, what didn't you get to do that you're getting to do now? Lead roles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank fucking God. So it's a bit crass, but like, if I see a lead role, and it's got a few falls, I'm like, oh, but it's a lead role. Like, that's so nice. To be honest, I would give it more attention than I should. And then characters who are really messed up really attract me because I think when the business doesn't know what to do with you because they can't even figure out where you're from or what color you are, you tend to get roles that are, you don't get to play the intellectual drug addict who is spouting Proust. Mm. I'd like to do that. Do you ever feel complicated? Like, do you still get offered roles that are sort of like Latin characters? And do you feel complicated about that in like 2020? Or are you sort of like, this is what I'm being cast as? It happens less and less because I think everyone knows like now you can't do that. So the, that doesn't come up as much. What comes up more, though, is this hybrid situation. Like, I just shot a film in Spain where you literally don't know where I'm from. 
but I live in Spain and it's clear I'm not Spanish and they don't explain it. That happens more. But yeah, I think people are now wary of even going there. So I don't even have to deal with that. Sarita, I'm a lesbian. Damien and I are lesbian enthusiasts. This is our brand. So by our count, you have played a lesbian on film in the experimental movie Fresh Kill in Spike Lee's She Hate Me and on TV's Blind Spot. You also play a bisexual woman having an affair with your ex, Carrie Ann Moss, on Jessica Jones. And we want to note that you have an uncredited role in the lesbian art film High Art, which we love, directed by Lisa Chilodenko. First of all, we need you to explain that uncredited role. And second of all, what is it about directors that have them saying, Sarita Chowdhury, lesbian? You know, I get it, but I can't <laughs> give you an answer. But I get it. Yeah. It's like it total Earth sense. Mother, maybe, sort of. It's like, I don't even want to know why. I just get it. I get it. Okay, yeah. tell us about how, like, what is your role in high art and why is it uncredited? I didn't know it was uncredited. I'm going to call Lisa. Um, <laughs> and so I had done a short film with Lisa and I loved doing, working with her so much. And so I think she just wanted me to be part of high art. Maybe it's uncredited because who knows at that age, I could have been like, Lisa, this role's so small, don't credit me. Like, I'm, I'm just cooler than that. Like, who knows? I don't even remember my role. Like, I just wanted to be around that cool gang. It was such a great script. That was a great mm -hmm. movie. It is a great movie. It is like a depressing lesbian movie, which I'm not into as a trope, generally speaking, but I have to say it's one of my favorite lesbian movies. Yes, because there's a dryness in it, and you still get to enjoy everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. Patty Clarkson. In that German accent, so good. Okay, Sarita, your friend Sakina Joffrey, who was a past guest on You Might Know Her From, has claimed that Hollywood often casts women of color as lesbians, but only puts them in interracial relationships. Can you co-sign this th theory that we call the full Joffrey? Oh my goodness. Well, my theory is you also can't have more than one person of color in a scene. So... You have to be in an interracial relationship. So, yeah. I've never been with another woman who was the same ethnicity or race in a, in a relationship with them. No, like I said, it's not allowed. You so you're allow. saying they, when you're a lesbian, they're casting you opposite white women generally. Well, your girlfriend well, on Blind Spot is black. True. Okay. True, but it was Spike Lee. No, no, Blind Spot, the TV show, she oh, hates Blind me. Spot, you're okay. right. First that of all, was, that's good. But then Carrie Ann Moss is white. Yes. Can we talk about She Hate Me for a second? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I had never seen it before, which is shocking because I do like Spike Lee movies a lot and I like lesbian movies. I don't know that I would classify it as a lesbian movie, but it is really shocking to go back and watch it. But I just want to say that Wikipedia lists your character in She Hate Me as a lesbian virgin, which is not true. Your character, for the record, says that she has never slept with a man, but she is a lesbian, which does not mean that she is a virgin. I just want to clarify. And I was very upset by this bullshit. I'm very upset. I'm going to call Spike. Okay. <laughs> Text him now. <laughs> did Lisa Spike? Oh, my God. Did <laughs> Anthony Mackie get naked in that scene where he was supposed to show you his dick? Or was he, like, he had a little covering? Yeah, no covering. Okay. Oh, you just slipped that question in because we were laughing and being friendly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I have one follow-up on lesbianism. Okay, in Jessica Jones, one of your sex scenes, which has a lot of internet love, is with Carrie Ann Moss, of course, and it involves a cello. So I just wanted to check in because I was very excited about the scene, but here's one of the things that I find most annoying about lesbian sex scenes in Hollywood. They always feature, like, some sort of sensual prop so it's always like a pearl buttoned cardigan or like a peeled avocado being passed between like dewy hands and as an actress who has played multiple lesbians on screen i wanted to see if any of that resonated with you yes and i can't believe you're saying this because you know carrie ann and i talked a lot before shooting because we kept saying we don't want any already having the cello with her behind, like, 
we had talks with the producers and got rid of a lot of stuff that just, I was like, no, this would be in the eighties between a man and a woman. Like I, we cannot do that. And so in the end, probably some of this, cause you, you can't control like the lighting and the way it's shot and all, but I remember just wanting it to be nothing just like, like, and I never knew why it can never be that. It's very rare. It's always got to be the sort of like softly lit or soft touching warm up or like sort of like longing stares leading into a sex scene. Anyway, I just find it very interesting. And I'm well, very, and also, go why ahead. Do you think, why do you think they don't have a director or someone there who's just like, that just doesn't happen. Like, I feel like on shows that are more explicitly queer, there is sometimes like an argument to be made if the director is queer to say like, oh, that's not really how lesbian sex happens or like it is, but that is sort of an annoying trope that we're tired of. But anyway, I just like, I remember on Sex in the City, Sonia Braga and Kim Cattrall like have a lesbian relationship. And it's like their moment of truth is like where they're like washing dishes in the sink and their hands touch. And like, that's as far as we get in terms of like the sexuality. And I was like, we haven't come that much further Anyway, I am into the sex scene, but I thought the cello was a lot. Yeah. See, the cello wouldn't have been a lot if it wasn't, you can do the cello, you could, you could do anything and it never be a lot. It just does nothing, because what's interesting about sex, the sex isn't sexual. The attraction is unbearable. And that's what you want to see. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Cerrito. We have now entered the part of our show for our rapid fire. Rapid fire for us, you can take your time, but we're just going to be throwing things nonsensically at you. And you can take your time if you need, but these will be no segues and whatnot. By our count, you sing in at least two films, Wild West and For Real. And you've worked consistently in New York theater, The New Group, The Bear Group, and At The Kitchen. If you were going to dig your teeth into a musical theater production, is there a dream role? I'm tone deaf. Are you lip syncing in in Wild West and also in For Real? Half, half. Yes. No, yes. Yes. In For Real, they had to... No, in Wild West, they told me they... I don't think it's me. In For Real, they had to ask the extras to look happier. The extras were like this. They were shocked. (laughs) Do never bring up the word musical to me. Gotcha. I'm tone deaf also, so I feel for you. Okay, Sarita, Ben Kingsley was originally cast as your father in Mississippi Masala, but he had to drop out of the film before shooting. Fast forward 23 years when you're cast as his love interest in the 2014 movie Learning to Drive. Was that weird? And what the fuck is wrong with the industry? What the fuck is wrong with this industry? That is not that. It's weird. But then did you see Ben Kingsley in that film? He's an attractive man. He's very sexy. Yeah, so it's fine. It's a fucked up industry. Yeah. Okay. Mississippi Masala was your first movie. What did you buy with your first movie paycheck slash did you steal anything from the set? Definitely stole a little coffee cup and saucers. I used to be obsessed with that for five years of my life. Number two, bought a ticket to Uganda to see Mira film the first part of Mississippi Masala. And I remember spending $5,000. I mean, I thought it was so much money I earned. I didn't earn that much money. You star in a 2004 short called Exactly, opposite Rosie Perez. In your last scene, you appear pregnant on a rooftop and force Rosie to shake out all the feathers of a down pillow as a means to accept her apology. What is the most New York thing you and fellow famous New Yorker Rosie Perez have ever done? Together? Yeah. Nice. Rosie coming to my apartment and saying, do you want to come to a premiere with me? And me saying, yeah. And Rosie pulling out of her purse a dress, pearls, and a bra in her purse. And she was like, put this on. And I did. And we left the house together. But I love Rosie Perez so much. She's everything you think she is. We want, we want to meet her, so. I will put the, I'm going to tell her. You, no, <laughs> she... This is going to crash if you, oh, you guys together. I can't believe she fucking carried a purse, a bra, and like she carried it. She brought you an outfit. She knew you were going to say yes. She brought the outfit. Fucking so cool. So cool. Oh, my God. You worked with Michael Douglas in the aforementioned A Perfect Murder, and then you play his sort of mistress in It Runs in the Family, where, as I watched 
just the other evening, you nibble on his ear sexually. Did Michael Douglas personally request you for It Runs in the Family? No, I auditioned for that. We were certain he requested you. <laughs> Maybe he did, but I remember auditioning. <laughs> That's <bad. laughs> If you say so. <laughs> okay. Sarita, in House of Spirits, your character had very bad teeth. One of our former guests, Jessica Hecht, told us that the new wave of serious acting involves prosthetic teeth. When you're doing a prestige job, what do you prefer to help you get into character? Fake teeth or a wig? Oh, fake teeth. <laughs> the best. Do you know, I forgot about that with House of Spirits. That was so much fun. It's, you don't have to act. Put them in. <laughs> Done. Oh, thanks for reminding me. I'm going to do that more often. <laughs> yeah, I've been wasting my time. Going oh, don't even skip that class at midnight and just put Wednesday a class? What? <laughs> that a key? Oh, man. Sarita, what a joy. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. You're, this is a tricky show. I had so much fun. I didn't know what answers I gave you. <laughs> and I realized this is how the 90s were. We just answered, there was no public, no one told, like you had no idea what was going on and you were tipsy usually. This, if you, you guys should get everyone on this show, something happens. Well. Like truth comes out. You know why? Because you guys are smart and funny and it makes us want to be it too. So we're just like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them that one story I didn't tell anyone. Like, that's what we want to do. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can't tell you this has been like a year in the making, but it is like exceeded all expectations. Can I tell you also how well prepared you brought up a short film I did with Rosie Perez called Exactly. I had, I didn't even know I did that. Oh my God. I am blushing we were both <laughs> blushing on camera she was so kind to us also i just wanted to give a shout out to our friend brenna one of our best friends friend of the podcast who mentioned to me that kama sutra was a sexual awakening for her and i kind of felt the same way watching it i had not seen it and the movie is beautiful and both sarita and indira varma are stunning in it and give great performances so highly recommend Brenna really said that like when she was 15 and it was showing over and over again on you know like Cinemax or wherever it was that it really lit her loins also just like something to tease for a future clip show or something is that we did get some primo Tom Hanks talk because she played Tom Hanks's love interest in a hologram mm -hmm. for the king and so um I just wanted to wet your whistles about that because I was like oh my god Tom Hanks you know like I I love Tom <laughs> Hanks and like loves to hate him so we have a good you know we have some good stuff about that coming folks you know what to do make sure you subscribe to you might know her from wherever you listen to podcasts and make sure that you're leaving us that five star written review if you want the book you can make that happen while you're leaving the review so we need to quit our full-time jobs this is really just exhausting <laughs> <laughs> you might know her from is produced by us two idiots, Ann Rodeman and Damian Bellino. Please follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Damian Bellino and at Rodeman. That's R O D E M A N N E. And we want to shout out our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment, Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. All that editing, you, all that editing. Sorry, it's spelled here. That's wrong. okay. My, you know, I can't read. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to switch it up, Daniel. All that editing. <laughs> the wrong it's year spelled, it's it's spelled h-e-r-e -E. okay <laughs> keep this all, all, all that editing you hear also by daniel sears we asked him to leave this in thank you to gang for all the music you hear in these episodes you can find them on itunes and wherever you listen to your music what was the name that Anne hayes used when she like emerged celestia <laughs> 